Hey everybody, this is Nolan Harrison, the Senior Director for the NFLPA Former Players, and I'm here with Mike Jones. Mike Jones played linebacker for me with the uh, Oakland LA Raiders. He also played, as you well know, uh, for the LA uh, St. Louis Rams, so you got to make that, make that distinction, just like the LA Oakland Raiders, you know, they were in both places, uh, but you know him as the tackle. Um, in the Super Bowl, which gave the Rams their Super Bowl win. Uh, he's done numerous things in terms of community and, and charity. Um, it's just great to have him on board, former teammate. Thanks, Mike, for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me, Nolan. Hey, tell me what's going on with you now. I mean, it's, 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 uh, we're, we both got drafted the same year. I'm sure you probably know there's, Brett was one of the last of our draft classes, the class of 1991. Um, but take us back to, uh, to, uh, you as a running back in Missouri and uh, being drafted by the L.A. Raiders at that time. Right. You know, it's, it's so ironic that I'm talking to you because both of us played against each other in college. And, uh, you know, at the time, neither one of us knew each other. And uh, uh, so when I, when I my senior year in college, I, um, I'm playing, we're in a one-back set, and we're doing a lot of stuff that a lot of teams are doing now. We, you know, shotgun, throwing the ball all over the place, and, so I caught the ball to the backfield. I, I, I ended up setting a record for Mizzou at the, for the most ta- for the most receptions in a season and, and in a career for a running back. So I'm thinking I'm doing pretty decent. But the problem was I wasn't a I wasn't a, a quote unquote true running back. I was one of those twinner guys. I was I wasn't big in the I wasn't a fast, quick, elusive, powerful guy to be a feature back, and I wasn't a you know knock him off the ball type fullback. So I was kind of an in between guy. So when the, when the draft came, you know, everyone talked to me, you know, about, you know, where they were looking to draft me. And unfortunately, I didn't get drafted. You know, so at the end of the draft, uh, the Raiders called. And at the time, you know, because you, you're a defense lineman, uh, there was another Mike Jones that was playing that, that both of us were in the same class. So I thought they, they called, the Raiders called and said they were thinking about taking me as a linebacker. So I thought they had made a mistake, an honest mistake, thinking that they were contacting Mike Jones from North Carolina State, not Mike Jones from, you know, from Missouri. So they, they call back. My agent tells me to go get on the plane. Uh, they have a ticket waiting for me when the draft's over with. So I get on the plane. I fly out to, to L.A. I uh, get picked up. They take me to the hotel, tell me to order wherever I want to, you know, you know and, and they'll see me in the morning. So the next morning I get up, I work out, and uh, they work me out as a, a running back slash linebacker. I run the 40 twice, and then from then on I was doing linebacker drills and, I guess the rest of history, they, they, they turned me to a, a linebacker, and you know I had to learn how to play the position, never played it before other than in high school, and you know, I had a couple guys that really helped me out. Uh, Dr. Cunningham was a good coach for me. Uh, Jim Hazard probably was a guy that, that really taught me how to play because I went, played uh, 16 games in the regular season and, and then uh, the playoff game, and then we moved to – the season ended, and it was ironic, we, it, it ended in Kansas City, where I'm from, and um, on the way back, uh, Mr. Davis – called me to the front of the plane and said he, he thinks about having me play in the World League. So I'm thinking, okay, you know, maybe he's just talking, you know, because he wanted to give me a little more playing time, but I think nothing was, was going to happen of it. About two weeks later, my agent calls me, tells me that uh, he wants me to play in the World League, and uh, so I go to the World League and I meet Jim Hazard. Now, how crazy is that? I mean, you, you break you break records as a running back. I mean, I, I remember we were stopping Mike Jones. We weren't stopping anybody else at IU. We were stopping Mike Jones. I think we beat you by a, a field goal every single time. I think you missed a couple. Uh, you know, but you had us, and you had one of those wide right field goal kickers. And then you fast forward. We uh, we're all on the same team together, and I'm I'm ready to hit you in practice, and you lining up behind me. <laughs> Do you, do you want to put alcohol in the wound, or do you want to pour salt all the way? In? <laughs> <laughs> in Indiana, but yeah, it, it was a, it was you know it was a good time. I, mean, I had a great time playing running back, and and, I, and that's what I wanted to do. But the whole time when I was in high school and even in college, everyone was telling me that I needed to play linebacker. They thought I'd be a better linebacker. And the ironic thing was how I went to the Raiders and became a linebacker. I forgot to mention that my running back coach. You, you know, when you come out, they send out those questionnaires to these different teams and. The um, Raiders sent the information out, and my running back coach calls, writes in, you know, he tells uh, the guys, the general manager, that they thought I'd be an average running back at best, but he thought I'd be a great linebacker in the NFL. Wow. And that's, what, and, that's, and that's how it all started, to be honest with you. That's the Raiders were talking to me. And when I played the Blue-Gray game, 
No, they were asking me, okay, do you want to play linebacker? And I'm like, well, where is it coming from? I said, because I never played linebacker before. I said, well, we just got word that you, you know, that you, you're thinking about playing linebacker. So about three or four times, the coach at the Blue Gray game and also the scouts asked what I think about switching over to linebacker. So I'm like, no, nah, I'm a running back. And, you know, it went through the draft. didn't work out. But anyway, fast forward to the first season, I get down to the Raiders. I go to the World League, and that's where I meet Jim Haslam. And Jim Haslam. If anybody knows has and knows you play for Jim. Oh, yeah. Has the words, his emotions on his sleeve. Yes, he does. So the first time I walk into the meeting, I'm talking about he doesn't know me from Adam, and I don't know him from Adam. I walk in and say, how you doing, Coach? My name is Mike Jones. The first thing out of his mouth is, why did they send me a guy that can't play linebacker? <laughs> <laughs> that is the first thing out of his mouth. I'm looking like, okay, what are you talking about? You know what? I got to, and he, and he, you know how Jim gets. He gets all excited. Well, I got three guys that can't play. I got a guy that plays stay strong. Say they got another guy to play cornerback. Now they send me a damn running back. We, and, like, and to give our listeners some context, uh, <laughs> Coach Hazlitt played in the NFL also. So here's a former player who 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 has these words of wisdom for a new running back in the NFL. That's phenomenal. So so he so he says this right, and you know, and and I'm giving you the. The G-rated version, because you know how Jim talks. Oh, yes. So so he, he's going, flying off the handle. I'm like, well, I'm like, hey, coach, you need to calm down. I played linebacker last year. He's like, what are you talking about you played linebacker? I said, I played with the Raiders last year. He said, I thought you were you were on the practice squad and they cut you. I said, no, I was active all 16 games. He said, he was active all 16 games. I said, I was all active all 16. I played every game. I said, and I, and I played special teams. I played a little third now, and I played in the playoff game. He said, oh, them guys told me you never played linebacker before. I'm thinking I'm getting a, a guy to play running back. Don't know what the hell he's doing. And like you said, and, and Jim just rambles. So I'm like, no, nah, Coach. So anyway, you know, we, we go in it. We start practicing. And uh, it, like I said, the practice, like I said, the best thing was to happen to me was playing for him because they moved me from an outside linebacker to an inside linebacker. And, it, and it's, a, it's a whole different type of game inside. So, you know, and because he was a former inside linebacker, he, he was able to teach me a lot of different things that I probably wouldn't have learned if I just went, went back for the spring and worked out. So I played the whole uh, off season there. Uh, we ended up winning the world championship. I go back to the Raiders, you know, and I, now, now I'm kind of wore out because I played 17 games the previous season. I played in the spring. Now I'm back in training camp a month later. So wow. it, caught up, it caught up with me, you know, during the season. Uh, I pushed through it. And in that off season, you know, I, I, we hit it, you know, and that was the year, like I so said, we had, we had just went, I think, 6-10 and 10 or 7-9. and nine. So, you know, we had we had that chippy, you know, the off season and then you had you know, we picked up Joe Kelly who was another guy that really helped me learn how to play linebacker. You had Winston there. So we had a great group of guys. And that during that year I kinda of, I grew as a linebacker, played a lot more and each year I got to play more and more until my fifth year where I became a starter. You know, and then you know, we ended up playing two years there and I ended up leading the team of tackle. So you know, if, if, if Al was a great visionary, I mean, I, without a doubt, if I didn't have an owner like Al Davis that, that was patient with me the first two years, I wouldn't have played linebacker. That's outstanding. And just think about the guys that you mentioned within that. Joe Kelly, and then you mentioned Winston Moss, who's the assistant head coach now up at Green Bay. And you mentioned Jim Haslett, who's been a head coach, who was my defensive coordinator at Pittsburgh, and now he's the defensive coordinator with the Skins. I mean, it's you were taught by some guys with pedigree. Exactly. You know what? And, and the one thing, you, when we came into the league, I don't know about other teams, but playing for the Raiders, I mean, they, two things always happen. They always took care of their own, and they always took care of them. They made sure the young guys understood what it took to be a pro. When you have, you know, Ronnie Lott on your team, Marcus Allen, and Howie Long, I mean, you know, I mean, you, you was right there with them. And seeing, seeing them guys that are, you know, Hall of Famers, you, and you know they're Hall of Famers, but the way they work, and how professional they were, and, and then all the things they said about, you know, making the money was one thing, but they always said one thing, make sure if you win, you're going to get whatever you want. It was always about winning. And, and I think a lot of people miss that from having not having a senior guy that's been in position to be in great on great organizations and great teams. That's priceless. I mean, that was absolutely priceless. Exactly, exactly. You couldn't, I mean, you couldn't pay for the stuff that they taught you, the stuff that you learned from as a young player so many guys that were Hall of Famers. I mean, you, we look at the guys we played with, and only for about six or seven years, we had one or two guys going into the Hall of Fame. Oh, absolutely. Ronnie, you, know, you had Ronnie Lott, Roger Craig, Tom Rathman, yeah. Eric Dickerson, Howie Long. I mean, it, we had a list. And we had a list of them. So, I mean, so we, and, and those guys were great people. And that's one thing I always, I always thought, but you know what? You, 
you meet Marcus Allen, you hear about Marcus Allen, you know, you, you read about him as a kid and as a college uh, college athlete, but until you get an opportunity to meet him and talk to him, there's no finer human being than, than Marcus Allen and Ryan Lott and Howie Long. So, you know, you, those, all those guys are just great, great people in addition to being, you know, great football players. So, you know, as I, like I said, as I got older, you know, it, I kind of aged real quick. I went, like, from the youngest guy on the team for about a year and a half to becoming the senior guy, you know, our last two years. Because, you know, you think about it, we were, you know, we had been there for six years, and most of the guys that we that we had learned from had already gone on to retire or something like that. So you, you transition pretty fast after your fourth or fifth year. That's right. So so after after I got done in, in Oakland, you know, it's, it's, it's so ironic. Everything happens. It seemed like every team I signed with was a crazy signing. When I go to St. Louis, I wasn't even supposed to be going to St. Louis. Uh, there was another linebacker that was there that was working out for him that they were going to sign. And he and I had the same agent. So our agent told me both of us to come over there. So I meet with the late Bud Carson, and he meets with Coach Ramil. And then we switch. Well, that night they called and said they wanted to sign me instead of the other guy. Wow. So, so I mean, and, and plus, plus I was living in St. Louis, so, you know, we went to dinner. We worked it out, and you know, I played for you know, Dick Vermeer. And a lot of guys that you that you talk to, you never know. You, Coach Vermeer has been away from the game for 12 years. So all of us that were playing for him, we had no one to call and talk to because everyone that played for him was pretty much out of the league. The only guys that played for him were actually the guys that were coaching for him. Right. So it's kind of, so you know, John Bunny. You know, I talked to John, but, you know, you talk to John as a coach, trying to talk to him as a former player, that play with Coach Mill, who's actually employing him, you're not going to get the same <laughs> <guy> <laughs> that doesn't play for him anymore. Those are those job security answers. There, there you go. So so we sit there, and we're in a meeting, and the first time, like I said, the first time when I decided to sign the rounds, that, that everyone has a Coach Mill story. So my story was this. I'm sitting there, he's talking to me. You know, he said he wants to sign me. He said, okay, we're going to work it out, won't be here. So he stands up and he sticks his arms out. So I look at him, I'm like, I know this guy don't want me to hug him. And, I, and I, so he walks over to me and hugs me. You know, he, he gets a little teary-eyed. And, you know, I'm looking like, okay, this is kind of weird. This is awkward. Maybe not weird. Maybe not the right word, but awkward. Wait, wait. So, wait, wait. Dick Vermeil, yeah. you, you just agreed to sign with them yeah. as a free agent, and he gets up and gives you one of those, man, oh, come on. Give me the hug. Yeah. Give me the, wow. <laughs> you know what? When you, when you meet Coach Vermeil and when, he, when, he, when you are a part of his family, you, he is all the way. I mean, he jumped both feet, legs, body, everything into it. Wow, so, that's outstanding. So, yeah, so when so our first team meeting, he has a bunch of former players there. So, you know, all these guys that played for him that went to the Super Bowl in the early 80s and all that. So we're sitting there talking. And then he's talking about these guys. And he gets teary-eyed about all of them. You know, he starts talking and, you know, he breaks down and starts crying. And, and then the guys that play for him, they do the same thing. So we're all looking like, okay, what is it about this guy? Because, you know, people... You know, everyone that you meet that talks about them, they love them. And you talk to anybody, you know, if you play for Coach Mill, they're going to tell you two things. He is hard, he is fair, and he loves you to death. So they'll tell you a few things about him. So, the first, like I said, so we, we get beyond that. We go to mini camps. We get through that. You know, and then we start training camp. And like I said, this is in 1997. So the the old three to four hour practices is, is really leaving the NFL. Right. So, so when we get in the camp, we got playbooks. Now, Coach Ramil gives you, he is the most organized man you'll ever meet in your life. He gives you a minute-by-minute minute almost schedule from the time you get there in July to the time the season ends in December. Wow. You have meetings. What time you have meetings. What days you have off. When the bye week is. When we're traveling. Where we're staying. At. I mean, all this is in our, in our game book. It is in our, in our um, playbook. So you're looking at the calendar and then you look at the dates, the, the, the practice schedule. So you look at the schedule and he's like, oh, Coach Mill must have a typo because he says that yeah, on the morning practice we got a two and a half practice and in the afternoon practice we got a three hour practice. Oh. <laughs> so we all think it must be a typo, you know, it's an hour. Nolan, man, hey, it, 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 was, it was the toughest training camp I've ever been to in my life. Well, I remember many complaints coming from, uh, I think it was Ernie, Ernie Combo, who's on our staff Ernie here at the Combo. PA now, uh -huh. saying, you, you got to help us. <laughs> He's trying to kill us out here. <laughs> well, well, you know what? And the thing is, you had to get through that to understand where he was going with it. He, he made a comment. He said, you can never prepare a football player on, uh, without, what was his exact name? He says, 
you help guys to get better on off the field by being better people. You help people help players become better players on the football field by practicing all the time. And that's what he believed in. He said you gotta practice it, practice it and practice it until you understand it. So when you when you're in your sleep, you can say, I'm gonna do this, this and this. That's how I'm, and then you gotta practice it again. But the thing is what it's not necessarily so much that, it's whether he trusts you or not. Right, and I, and I didn't, I didn't, I didn't understand it until he, until he, he explained it to me when we went to the Super Bowl. So the first year, we, I mean, we are pounding. I mean, we are getting out there for training camp, and I mean, guys are falling off like no other. So we, like I said, we win five games the first year. Second year, we regressed. We only win four games. We think we're going to slow down, and we know. So you know, after that second year, it, it's you know, it's, some, it's a lot of rumbles. You know, it's you know, it's some things like you know, we need to sit down and 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 I was a uh, guinea pig, for lack of a better word, because I was one of Coach Mills' first signees. He and I got along great. So all the players seen that. So what they would do is, you know, basically, I was a guy, you know, you know how you how, how uh, you, you use somebody as bait? I yep. was the bait. That's I right. I out there and see if the Tiger's going to eat him alive or if he's going to just let it go away. So I would be the guy that tell, hey, Mike, go talk to Coach Mills, see if we can do if we can do this or do that. You know, so I'll be the guy. I was a guinea pig. I'll go up there and talk to him. You know, he'd be yes, no, get the heck out of my office, whatever. You know, whatever <laughs> he so, you know, but we got we had a great relationship. Right. So, um, well, see, that's that uh, leadership. When when yeah. when when the guys know that you're that guy with integrity that has the respect of the of the ownership and respect of the coaches, you know that that's that's that speaks a lot to your character and your personality. Yeah. So we we get to, to year number three of Coach Mill, and this is where, like I said, the change happens. And it's drastic. When we get to training camp, you know, everybody's looking at the, you know the schedules. The guys have been there. We probably we probably have transitioned at least sixty percent of our team by then. The guys, when we started, when I was there, we, we probably I know I know we had this, without a doubt seventy percent of the guys that were on offense were gone. Now the defensive guys pretty much stayed there. So we look at the schedule and it's changed. You know, he, he's cut down the practice time. So I go ask Coach, and I'm like, Coach, you cut this practice time down. I said, why is that? He said, well, we went to minicamp, and we felt we was a good football team. He said, and that's when he told me how he, he judges the team. He said, Mike, I, you didn't know this, but we had, I always have a barometer on offense and defense of who is what, where we need to be as a team. When we practicing, the, temp, the tempo has to be a certain pace of our best player or the guy that practices the best. He said, I always based our practice schedule on you. He said, "If you if you if you didn't get tired, I kept on going." And I'm looking like, "Are you serious?" He said, "Yeah." He said, "If you if you were a guy that was could practice hard all the time, what I had to do was I had to get those guys that were around you to practice like you practice. And if you did that, then I knew I could pull the range back because I could trust that they were gonna do what they're supposed to." I was like, "I didn't even know that." He wow. said, "A lot of people don't know that." I was like, "Wow." That's awesome. Said, I'm thinking, so I'm thinking to myself. If I could have showed I was tired, he probably would cut back the practice a little bit. <laughs> but the, you wouldn't have had the team that you have. Exactly, exactly. So he set a barometer. I mean, and, and you know what? And it, it's ironic because when you look at all good teams, you see 10, 11, you know, 9, 10, 11 guys flying to the ball offensively, defensively, and special teams. When you see a team that's average, you might see three or four. That's right. If a bad team, you might see one or two. If you can get those one, two guys, you, 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 if you can get everybody to that level of practicing and playing at a speed and a tempo that everybody's playing at their hardest, whether they're good, bad, and different, you got what you want as a coach. And to see, that's what, to, for, for our listeners out there, understanding when we're watching film and practice or we're watching game film, when that clip ends and goes to the next play, if you were not on film, you were loafing. If you're not on film... You're one of those guys that won't be around very long. The winning defenses and the winning offenses and the winning special teams, almost everybody was on that camera film. And you actually programmed yourself to make sure you were in that zone. You knew it. It was mentally there. You knew you had to be in that zone before that click. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, like I said, once we got to that level, like I said, then that year, I mean, Super Bowl, that Super Bowl season, was, it was magic. There was no way around it. I mean, we had... You had Marshall Falk, who was probably the, the best player in football probably at that time. And then we probably had to say, the guy that doesn't get the credit that he deserves is Isaac Bruce. I mean, Isaac Bruce, the first two years I was here, he was, he, he had some hamstring problems. And when he got himself healthy, I mean, he was he was lights out. 
I mean, could no one cover him. You had Torrey Holt, who was a rookie to play, but Price would have been rookie of the year. That's right. Incredible rookie rookie season. You had a guy named Oz Zahir Akeem that was a, a slot receiver, kick returner, punt returner. You had another kid by the name of Tony Horn. This this, this is how drastic a uh, team, how much a, a talent shift changed. Our leading receiver, who was Ricky Pro, great position receiver, got it. I mean, he was our leading receiver the year before. He was our fifth receiver the year we went to the Super Bowl. Wow. Exactly. Wow. So that, that's, that's, that's how much of a talent change and how much you know, Mike Moore's system. It was, it was a lot of different things. Mike coming in, you know, Trent Green coming in, and Trent unfortunately gets hurt. And Indiana University, by the way, I do have to throw that out. Yes, another IU connection. <laughs> so Trent and then, of course, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't make up a better story. You couldn't write a story and people believe about Kurt Warner. You, I mean, you could if you wrote a book like that. If you made a movie, they'd be like, "Man, this is fiction. You can, it's not, this is this this is can, this cannot happen. This guy, this is make believe." But what he did and where he came from that season was was phenomenal. No, no, take take us into the locker room because I know as a defensive player, you know, you see both guys at practice, but you know, Trent was 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 balling. I mean, he he was killing it. And but, you have to look at the preseason. He goes down, and you're going, "Oh my God, this guy was bagging groceries and was in, was in arena league." No, I'm, I'm gonna give you one better. You gotta realize now, Kurt was on the team the year before. Kurt was our scout team quarterback. He was a guy that I mean, you know how scout team quarterback, so you expect to pick him off every day. That's right. So, so he goes from a scout team quarterback to our starting quarterback. Now, we like I said, we you had Marshall Falk, you had Isaac Bruce, you had Torrey, you had Ricky Pro. So, and then offensive line wise, you know, Adam Timmerman came on that, that solidified, and Orlando. No, he was a first round draft pick and he, he started playing better at the end of his south the second year. First year he played solid. Second year he got better. Third year he, he probably if he wasn't the best offensive lineman in the NFL, I, I would like to say could somebody tell me who was better than him? Because at, at his third year, he was as fast as physical as any offensive tackle you could find in, in the NFL. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So we, had, we, had, we had we had we had all the pieces. The only thing we questioned was Kirk. Well, the first preseason game, I mean, the unfortunate thing was uh, Trent got hurt the third preseason game. So, Kurt had another preseason game to get ready. Played solid in that preseason game, and then, I mean, it just clicked that first game. I mean, Kurt, you know, he was getting the ball out fast. You know, the one thing I think he understood was, you know what, don't ever get yourself in trouble, get the ball to your check down. If it's not there, get it to the check down. Then when you have a check down, Mark Marshall Falk. Now, you throw a three-yard pass in terms of a 70-yard reception, you know, it, it, it shows on stats you got a 70-yard reception even though you ain't do a three-yard. Yeah, yeah, that's not a bad, you know, future Hall of Famer is your check down last option receiver. That's that's not a bad thing for a, a, a quarterback coming in. There you go. Yeah, him. And then, of course, you talk about Ernie Conwell. Ernie Conwell is the strongest man probably. <laughs> if he's not the strongest, he wasn't the strongest guy in the NFL, he's one of the top five. And he still is. You should see him here in the office. It's He's, he's ridiculous. He makes me look small now. So Ernie, you know, Ernie's a great, great receiving, blocking tight end. You know, so we had all the tools to be good. And and you know, Mike Marks, you know, to his credit, he was a visionary. That you know, he knew what type of tools he had. And he wasn't a guy that they kept those, kept those toys as we call them on the sideline. He put them on the field, and he did everything possible to get the ball to everyone as many as many times as we could. So, you know, we defensively we were playing. I mean, we we were we were pretty good on defense. Uh, it was number one in defense up until last week of the season. And uh, so, you know, it helps when your offense is scoring points at the pace where it's going. You know, when you score once, you stop and score again. You stop and score again. You stop and you're down 17 to 21 to nothing. And, you know, you, as you as a defensive lineman, you pin your ears back. You know, we're sitting back looking for balls to pick off. So, oh, it's a track meet. Uh, it's a tra- exactly. It's a track meet, and you, and you know what they're going to do. If they decide to throw the, uh, run the ball, if they play in their hands because, you know, that time is not on their side. So, you know, we had the best of both worlds. So take me to that play. I mean, that's the, uh, the, that you're immortalized. You're forever in history. You're, the play's in the Hall of Fame. Tell me about that play and how it changed everything for you. Well, you know what? It, 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 you got to go back two plays to really appreciate it. The play before that, I and everyone, they showed that playing play when Steve scrambles around and, uh, you know, and he makes a play. The play before that, the last two plays of the Super Bowl, I always tell everybody the same thing. The team that didn't execute, that didn't execute was actually the team that had the right play call. 
the play before, they ran a hook and ladder. That's when Steve was running around? Right, Steve McNair. We, we jumped the hook and ladder, so Steve had nowhere to throw the ball. That's why he was scrambling around. Right. I jumped the tight end, and our DB and our strong safety jumped the, the, the wide receiver, coming, the running back coming behind him. So if you, if you look at the play before, he pump faces it, and then he starts scrambling because he had nowhere to go with the ball. Well, Steve makes a, a phenomenal play, throws the ball downfield to Kevin Dyson, catches the ball on the six-yard line. About the team. Somebody, I think it was on the team. Wow. So we, that that was all Steve McNair. So we go to the sideline, and we're all looking at each other like, we cover this play like no other, yet he completes the pass. We, 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 we are frustrated beyond belief. So we go in the huddle. Guys, we got one play. We stop them. We win the Super Bowl. We don't. We go to overtime. So we go back on the field. And when they start to play, and, and uh, like I said, a lot of people don't know this, the guy, they start off in a, like a slot formation with the tight end outside the wide receiver. The tight end motions in the end. Oh, excuse me. The wide receiver motions in and motions out. We weren't covering the wide receiver because we were making a call. So if they were snapping the ball, we were in a world of trouble. Oh, wow. So we yeah, so we look, out, we look out there and we have what we call a bracket coverage where I have all underneath routes, the strong safety has, the, 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 any vertical routes. And the outside, the cornerback has any outside and, uh, and and deep routes. So it was three on two. I, uh, the wide check goes up the field. I'm looking at Kevin Dyson the whole time. My hands on it. I mean, you look on the film, you can't really see because my back's to it. But I'm looking at him while I'm running with, with wide check. Cause right. I'm, I'm wanting him to throw the ball to the check now. Right. So I'm, so I'm running with wide check, and I see Kevin Dyson plant. So I plant, and I'm coming down here. I'm thinking, I'm going to kill Kevin. I said, he doesn't even see me come. I'm going to light him up. Well, the problem was when guys run routes like that, it's usually the running back that does that, not a wide receiver. So a running back is not quite as fast as a wide receiver, not quick, not as quick. So so my kill shot went to, I better get him on the football, on the ground. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, get, I, I come downhill on him and I, I wrap him up. And I never understood why he went down so fast until I watched it on tape in slow motion. When I wrapped him up, I brought my arm around, my left arm around to, to secure the tackle. Well, as I'm bringing my arm around, I catch his knee. And when I catch his knee, he falls like a tree because he has no balance. Right. So he, so he falls straight down and he bounces. And, and everyone's like, well, he was, he was at the one yard line. I said, no. I actually tackled him at about the three. I said, but what happened was when you, everyone sees the, sees the tape, you see him fall and then you see him extend the ball out. Well, he's down once he once his knee hits the ground, and then he spins the ball. I saw that the ball actually was down at about the two yard line. Oh, that's some insight we didn't know. You're right because all they show is him reaching out. They don't show any of that. Exactly. So when he falls down, you know they they, they had to make sure they had secured it. They had to make sure he was on the ground. He looked, and he, if you look at the fish, the fish actually goes to about the two yard line. Wow. So, you know, so it was. I mean, it, it was. I mean, they, they say it was a great play. I said, no, I just do. What I do all the time. So I didn't. I didn't rush the quarterback beat the offensive line and then sack him and force a fumble. I didn't pick a ball off. I just do what I do all the time. I tackle him. You know, I, I, I supposed to be in position to make a play and tackle him. I tackle him. I said, just so happened to be, it was the last play of the Super Bowl. So, but it was, I mean, after that, you know, it was pandemonium. You know, we, you know, we won the Super Bowl. And, you know, it was always great because, you know, I'm, I'm a Missouri kid. So I got an opportunity, you know, win a, win a Super Bowl. And uh, and uh, for the state of Missouri. See that, and and see, but just listening to that part, yeah, I just did my job. Yeah, that I didn't do anything different than what I was supposed to do. But we do know that when you look in the real world, people who have not had a chance to play sports, who haven't had a chance to deal with adversity, which you had to deal with the play before, and people who don't know how to deal with pressure, could never understand that it's it's that's my job. I'm, I make these plays all the time. It doesn't matter if it's the last play of the Super Bowl and we're on the one, on the two, three yard line. And if I miss this tackle, and none of that enters your mind. Man, ball, bring them down. There you go. There you go. That's outstanding. Now, take that part. I mean, you've had such an outstanding career outside of the game. Uh, you're a head coach now. How have you been able to transition all those lessons you learned from the different adversities that you had to overcome and achieve? And then your climax, how have you taken that into your successful transition into your postseason and being a former player? Well, I'll give you a prime example, and, and 
people probably don't know this. I uh, coached high school football for six years at a, at a school, Hazelwood East High School. You know Bernard Winnington. Right. Bernard, Bernard, that's where Bernard went to high school, Terrell Fletcher. We probably had, the high school I went to uh, is, in, is in the suburbs of St. Louis, Missouri. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a high school that has been nationally ranked. It's a, one of the top high schools in the state of Missouri. And I got opportunity to coach there. So, I mean, it, it was a, it was a whole different level because I had to learn how to, I had to, I had to, had it less the for less of a better word, dumb it down because when you become a coach, you, you the first thing you got to realize is you're not coaching you. Right. You, you, that's the biggest thing as a coach you have to realize, especially as a former player. You know, and, and I don't care what level. If you were, if you were a good high school player or just a passing high school player, coaches get frustrated because they don't the kids don't play like they like they want them to play like like you believe you will play. And that's the one thing you got to remove from. You got that's the biggest thing I had to remove. I'm sitting there at the first practice. I'm like, you didn't see the guard pull, and you didn't see the quarterback. You know, the, the, the offensive tackle pop, and then these kids looking at me like, what are you talking about? You know, I'm, I'm like, I'm talking a foreign language to him, but I'm talking to him like he's a professional athlete, not a 15 year old kid in high school. But don't so they had, don't they say that that's the reason why um, most of the real successful you know, the Hall of Fame guys, you know, the Michael Jordans of the world, why they can't coach. I mean, you know, there's an exception here and there, but as a whole, you want those guys to be you. It, but you know what? You, you, can't, you can't see anything other than you. That's the, that's the problem. So, you, like I said, you, you play with guys that, that weren't as good as you, but, you, but it, it was never a problem because you were the guy that was in charge of how you play. So if a guy was next to you wasn't as good as you thought he should be or wasn't, you didn't worry about that. You had to do what you're supposed to do. But when you become a coach, you can't. You got to remove all those elements out of it. You got to figure out how to make that guy that's in front of you the best player he can possibly be. Not the best player that can be just like Mike Jones or Nolan Harrison, but the best he can possibly be. And that may be a second-team player. That might be a bench player. That might be a kid that just loves to come out and be on the team. But you but you got to remove yourself from that. And that's the, that was, like I said, it took me about, a, about two weeks and then, my best friend who's on the staff could pull me. He said, Mike, these guys aren't pro football players. You got to quit coaching them like that. You, you, you got these guys trying to read this and that, whatever, and these guys are, aren't getting any better. They're getting worse because they think, you know, you tell them stuff that, they first of all, they already have problems understanding the basic stuff. Now you try and get them, you're taking them from pre, pre-algebra to calculus three. <laughs> and I was like, you know what, that is a great analogy. He said, I'm sorry, I go what coach over, I, I got you now. He said, "These guys aren't those guys. You got, you got, you got to, you got to dumb it down, Mike. You got, you got to get them to do the basics, and then build from that. As they get good at the basics, then you go to something else. Because he had been a high school coach for a while, and he said he had the same problem going from being a college athlete to a high school coach. He said, he said it took me about a year to figure out these guys aren't college football players. These guys are high school players. Most half of them just out there because they want to be, they want to be part of something. So." You got you got to dumb it down. So like I said, we I end up doing that the first year we go and I in high school I never got past the first round of playoffs. So I go to a high school that's perennially in the state championship. So the first year we go to the state championship. We lose in the state championship and then we go three years without making the playoffs. We go nine and one, one nine, eight and two one year in which uh, <laughs> we won our conference but because of the point system we didn't make the playoffs. So I go three years without making the playoffs. Now now I'm super frustrated. Wow. My, my head football coach, he gets promoted to vice principal, so he can't coach. So I, they named me the head football coach. The first year I become head football coach, we won the state championship. Nice. Congratulations. Thank you. But this is this how ironic this is. We play at the Dome. We won the state championship on the Hail Mary. The same play I stopped, we won the state championship on. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's a story. Wow. I, you know what? It was unbelievable, and it, see, and it was so crazy because the kid, like I said, one of the greatest kids we ever had, I ever coached. You know, he's he's, he's playing college football now, and uh, he's playing in the same conference we are, and he, and he killed us the first game we played him. But I mean, just a great kid. I mean, he this kid won the state championship for us in football on the hail mary. We won the state championship in track. He runs the an anchor leg to win the four by four, and we had to win that to win the state championship in track, and he does that too. Wow, six exactly. degrees of separation. Yeah, there you go. So, 
mean, it was over there, like I said, I coached there for another year. We made the playoffs, but we lose in the first round. And then uh, Stump Mitchell gets the head coach job at Southern University. I go down to Southern. Uh, that's the first time I ever coached college football. And uh, learned a lot down there. Uh, we didn't play as well as we wanted to. You know, and, uh, now, what was that transition like, going from uh, – yeah, because I coached a little high school football, and you know, it's it's the kids are there for the love of it, but it, it becomes. I mean, they're still in it for the love of it in college, but it starts becoming that business because you have to take care of the student part of it, and it's a lot more difficult as a student athlete in college. What was that like as a coach to adjust to that? Well, you know what? Because I coached at a pretty good, pretty big, and pretty good program, it, it wasn't too much of a transition because most of the kids that come. That, that one that I coached at the high school I was at Hazelwood East. Most of the kids that played at that at that school, they most of them believed in their minds they could play college college football. So that that, that the mindset was a little different. I mean, some of, some other schools might be different. Some schools it might be a kid that just doesn't want to play. But for the most, about sixty percent of the seventy percent of kids that I coached, they wanted to play college football. So that they were willing to listen to what I had to say. And then most of them that I coached in high school, they knew you know because I was coaching in St. Louis, they knew who I was, they had an idea, they either attended my football camp or heard about it, so they kind of had an idea of what we were looking for. When I got down to Southern, so I'd never been anywhere, you know, I'd never been in the South, I'd never been to Baton Rouge, so right. I, didn't know, I didn't understand the, dy- the dynamics or anything like that of, of coaching a kid from the South, and, and the one thing that's, that's different, and I, I can honestly say this, when I was coaching up, up in uh, St. Louis, was that the kids, the, 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 the mindset is a whole lot different. These kids really want to play. They really love playing this, that sport. And not saying the kids from Missouri don't, but it's just a different, just a little different mindset. You know, usually you get a kid from the South that really, I mean, they've been playing it since they were four or five years old compared to kids that start playing football when they're in high school. Right. A little different mindset. Yeah, the desire strong. Exactly. Desire, desire, the desire is different because, like I said, they've been, they've been doing it for so long and they understand it. So, we go down there, and uh, it's you know it's a new we're a new head, we're a new coaching staff. We come in for a guy that's, that that was a, a pretty much a legend in Southern. I mean, he had coached there for 17 years. He had won, I want to say, three national championships. So you know, we was following a guy that you know there was some big footprints we had to follow up on. And uh, you know we struggled. You know we had some guys that play hard that, that, that did the right thing, but uh, we just couldn't. Like I said, we we playing a pretty tough swax, pretty tough conference, and you know, we didn't play very well. Uh, you know, we ended up, I think, 2-9. and nine. And after the season was over with, you know, a job opened up, the Lincoln where I'm at now opened up. And I thought, I mean, I thought it was a unique situation for me because I'm from Kansas City. I went to school in Missouri, which is 30 minutes from here. And then I, and I played in St. Louis and coached in St. Louis. So I had a, a different, you know, a different outlook on how to approach recruiting for Lincoln University. So I thought, you know, I'll put my name in the hat and see how it goes. You know, I've only been a college coach for one year. I had been a head coach for two years at the high school level. So I put my name in the hat. Uh, some people believed in me. Uh, Dr. Mahoney, the, the, the president of the university, she uh, she thought it would be good. Why did she hire me? And she hired me. And I got my coach staff together. I hired two guys that I played with at Mizzou with, um, you know, and uh, some guys I worked with at Southern. You know, we put a pretty decent staff together. Uh, this program, so everybody knows, I mean, we – they haven't had a winning season here in 39 years. Wow. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, 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 the most wins we've had here has been five, and that was back in the early 80s. Now, that's a challenge. It, it's a big-time challenge. But, I mean, you know what? You know what? I, everyone says it's a challenge. I say it's an opportunity. There you go. I say it's, a, it's an opportunity. The conference that we play in, the last eight years, seven of the last eight years, they've had a, the runner-up or the national champion come out of this conference called the MIAA. Northwest Missouri State, you know, Central Missouri. Wow, okay, uh, okay. Yeah, so, we, so we have we have five nationally ranked teams in our conference. But the thing, the reason why I say it's an opportunity is this. Uh, these same kids that are going to these schools, we have opportunity to recruit the exact same type of kid. Right. They can win at those conferences, and we got a model that's unbelievable. You got a, a school like in Northwest Missouri State that has won, like I said, they played in, I want to say, in the last – 15 years, they probably played in eight national championships, winning about four or five of them, or six, I think what it is. And they were exactly where we were right now. They had been a, a school that was floundering. You know, one year they win four or five games, and they might win two, and then they might win six. They they, were, they they couldn't figure out what they were doing, and they got a coach there 
to stay there for 20 years. He dug in the first year. He went, you know, 0 and 10. Second year he went. He won, I think, four or five games. Third year they made it to the quarterfinals of the, of the, of the, of the playoffs. So he built a program there. He just kept building and kept building. And then all the teams around us did the same thing. So I said, no, we got a perfect model in a school that's less than 200 miles from us. Recruit kids from this area. Recruit kids with high character. Get them stronger in the weight room. Get them faster in the weight room. Graduate them. Keep them here. And you're going to build a successful program. That's we're gonna, we're key. Gonna them up. Graduate them. I love the fact that I heard you say that because we know the graduation rates. We know that there are schools that are churning out men that aren't prepared for the real world. I love the fact that you talked about graduating them in the same breath as you talked about training them and getting them stronger for the football field. Right, right. But know what, Nolan, and, and, and you have, and there's two reasons why you got to graduate. First of all, it's right. I mean, they, they come to college to, to get a degree. I mean, if you're fortunate enough at the Division One level, which is less than 1% of the guys at that level, play at the next level. So if it's less than one percent at that level, you can you you can just imagine what it is at Division One AA or the level, the level I'm at at Division Two. So you have to graduate kids. But see, the the thing is, what's a misnomer at this level and at the school is this: we had so many so many years where kids were coming for a year and leave, come for two years and leave, and not graduate. Well, two things happen when you don't graduate. Of course, you know, you, your, your opportunities of, of getting better employment, you know, it might shrink. It, it, it probably shrinks somewhat and things like that. But more, more so than that, you don't have loyalty to the school you went to. Correct. If I, here three, if I can keep you here three years, three years you working towards your degree, the likelihood of you getting your degree goes up probably 20% every year you stay there. So you after after your third year, you work until your fourth year, you, you already passed the point of no return. Why are you, like I said, you don't think to yourself, I've invested so much time and money in here, I need to stay here. That's right. The thing is, if I'm still, like I said, hopefully I'm still here and you're still here, we're, we're, winning, we're, we're winning football games. So you're in part of a winning program. And then finally, like I said, you, you build loyalty by, by, by being with somebody on a daily basis. Someone can't get, you can't have loyalty with somebody that you see every other day or every month or every two months, something like that. Because you don't know what they're doing. You can't trust them or anything like that. But if you, if you see me every day for three years, you can best believe you're probably going to be back the next year. And then once you graduate, now you're an alumnus, and you're a proud alumnus, and you're part of something that's been rebuilding. Now you, you're more likely to donate money to the program. You're more likely to come back. You're more likely to say good things about the program. So the longer you stay there, the better things happen. That's a great strategic plan. A lot of guys... You know, don't look forward like that. Um, you know, it's, this is just another example of um, what you've been able to accomplish and why your 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 transition from the field uh, to the coaching staff and, and being a successful businessman uh, has come to fruition because of this type of uh, of mindset and strategy. It's it's outstanding. Mm -hmm. You know, and and and, and, I, and I, like I said, I, I I got it from Mr. Davis. I mean, if I like I always go back. Everyone asks me about what was it like playing for Al Davis. I said, you know what, you'll never hear me say a bad thing about that man. He was always good to me. I said, he gave me an opportunity with, in which 20 other, 29 other teams didn't. You know, he took a chance on a guy that never played linebacker before that was an in-between guy that had to learn how to play a position. He, he, he gave me two years to learn how to do that. He invested time and effort into me becoming the man I am, it's not, not just a football player. It taught me how, like I said, you got to have patience when you work with certain things, with certain kids and certain people. Because everyone's not going to get it all tonight. You know, if he would have been impatient like most people were, me and I wouldn't be talking right now. Matter of fact, I probably wouldn't even have made the Raider team at the time. So, you know, you got you got to have some patience. You know, now, granted, you know, sometimes kids and, and people aren't doing what they're supposed to. And, but for the most part, you know, I'm, I'm saying 95% of the time, you get a kid opportunity and he's working, doing what he's supposed to. Something good gonna come out of it. it. Might not be. He, he may not be a great football player, but he might do something, get his degree. He might be a guy that can donate money to the program or or help you or be a great football coach, and he can help somebody that was like me to get where I'm at. So I mean, there's so many things that so many positives that can come from it if you just have a little patience and work at it. That's a great philosophy. <clears throat> Last question, and it's a twofold question, um, and it, it speaks to the current uh, situation at Penn State. Um, and also, what I know of you and your character, you've always been a hero to the kids, especially to the kids of Missouri. You've put on camps uh, for underprivileged children for years. 
uh, from when we were current players all the way through your former player career um, and now and still in coaching. What would you say is, I mean, there are roles in life in terms of uh, being a hero, being a father, being a coach. Um, I believe they all fall under the same banner. It's a hero in every single avenue if not you're letting the kids down. Being a father, being a coach, and knowing what Penn State is going through right now with, as we know, those who did not um, respond to their uh, heroism, um, their hero gene inside, whatever you want to call it, um, they let a lot of people down uh, criminally. Uh, from a coach and a father and a hero standpoint, what do you think is the most important in terms of uh, really molding our kids and the ones, especially the ones that look up to us? Well, I mean, the, the biggest thing is this. The, 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 uh, be honest. I tell all my players, you know, like I said, I, I'm not going to tell you what you need to hear. I'm, gonna tell you, I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. And like I said, sometimes that's not easy. You know, sometimes, you know, you got to tell a kid, you know what, you know, you're not doing the right thing. You're going to have some consequences. You just got to deal with it. You know, you got you got to be you got you have to be a man. We talking about building men and bearing, building characters in, in these men. You know, we can't like I said. There's certain things like I said. Some guys need help, and, and I'm not going to sit here and say you. There, there's a right way. There, there, there's a right way in many different ways of doing things. Some guys is a pat on the back. Some guys is yelling. You know, slap on the butt. Some guys is a slap on top of the head. I mean, there's different ways of how you can enforce being a model citizen, a good person. Because everyone has different hot buttons, so you gotta learn the people that you have. And the only way you can learn the people about it is by knowing. You know, all, all my student athletes, I gotta get to know them. Like I said, we we didn't do a good enough job this year. We wanted to meet with our, our student athletes twice a month, outside of football, ten minutes. See how you doing? How your parents doing? How you doing in class? How you social life? Because a lot of times, you know, all you see is coaches. You know, we either yelling at you or praising you for you for the things you're doing on the field. You know, and, and it's always the latter fact that when a kid gets in trouble academically or a kid gets in trouble, you know, and it's not a whole bunch of them, but some of them get in trouble, you know, doing the wrong thing. It's after the fact now you're being reactive instead of proactive. So I try and be proactive with all the guys I'm with, you know, and, I try, and, and being completely honest with them. You know, this is wrong. You got your consequences you got to deal with. You know, I, I help you as much as I can. But you know, so, you know, some of the things you have, you made this bed, you got land. So, and that, and that's at every level. I mean, that's not just you know the, the high school level, college level, or the pro level. That's just building character in, in young men. And well, Coach Mill said one thing that always sticks to me. He said, you know, I said, Coach, why? You know, you you've been at every level, and you've been the, he's been the national coach of the year at every level, high school, college, junior college college and the NFL. I said, how do you do it? He said, Mike, what you got to do is you got to be a teacher of men. You got to be a teacher of men. Now, the guys we teach just happen to be football players, but you always got to be a teacher of men. And if you go in with that philosophy, you're going to be successful. So I thought that was ironic he said that, a teacher of men. I think that's great. Great words to live by and a great message to end on. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, I think we've been with Mike Jones. I still the greatest Super Bowl tackle of all time. Um, I'm biased, but I still think it's true. Head coach of Lincoln down there in Missouri and a great friend, great hero, great teammate. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Thank you. All right, take care.